The current administration is in office because of the mobilization of black and brown people across this country, people who sit in line for hours and hours on end. I mean, if there's one thing that religion and faith do really well, it's the grand story. There are a number of people who are kind of waiting for an invocation of faith as we talk about some of the grand challenges we face. I'm with Tope Filaria. I'm very happy to be talking to you. Thank you very much. For, Such a uh, pleasure to be here with you. And, and I'm particularly happy to be here in IPS. Um, I was a fellow of the Transnational Institute back in the 1970s, and I see behind you there is a magnificent uh, um, mural, uh, and this one of, in particular, of Orlando Letelier, mm. who was a fellow here at IPS and who was my director at the Transnational Institute, and I was working with him. Um, and then he was assassinated by Pinochet here in Washington and blown up. Um, and he was a magnificent man and a wonderful colleague and comrade. Uh, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to acknowledge that, being part of that tradition. And you're the new executive director of IPS here. And I wonder if you could just say something for an international audience about what the Institute is doing and how you come to take this job at this crucial turning point in American politics. Yeah, IPS, I think we see ourselves as a think tank that really serves movements. I think that's the one thing that's most important to us and perhaps even differentiates us from some other uh, research organizations and think tanks here in DC. Uh, we take our lead from what movements are doing. We try to provide them with communication support. Uh, we try to serve as a linkage between movements and what's happening. Uh, you know, sort of on Federal Hill and government offices around the country. Right. Um, and so that, I think, is our focus. And, uh, you know, it's, it's wonderful to be sitting here in, in front of these wonderful images because it reminds us, I think, of IPS's great history, which you just alluded to. Um, and that's one of the things that I think I was most inspired by when I began to think right. about being involved in IPS. Um, in terms of my own trajectory, my parents are from Nigeria. I was born and raised in Utah, which is in the western part of the United States, which, which is in a very diverse part of this country at all. I was, to my knowledge, one of very, very few, I was going to say perhaps the only, but perhaps there was some other uh, Nigerian family around when I was growing up, but I certainly didn't meet them. And so I grew up in a predominantly white environment, um, and we were incredibly isolated. So when I, I was 13, my parents decided that we should move to uh, to Texas, and so I lived in Texas, various cities in Texas from uh, the age of 13 until I graduated from high school. So I came in under this idea that I wanted to learn how to become a better public scholar, to learn more deeply about the issues that right. I care about. And also uh, IPS, is, as you well know, has been at the forefront of so many important social movements. Right. Um, um, historically, it was somewhere which preserved a space that was needed for debate and discussion yeah. <clears throat> as American politics moved to the right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense of uh, perhaps since 2010, since Occupy, yeah. since a new sense of energy with the rise of Bernie Sanders and you've now got a progressive caucus yeah. and there's now in, in Congress. Do you think that is quite new? I think there has been a shift, a discernible shift since 2010 and the thing that's heartening about I suppose politics in this moment is that you have a number of folks who feel empowered to express themselves in ways they haven't before. People who, for whatever reason, believed the kind of big narratives that have uh, kind of uh, powered this country right. for a long time. And now they're saying, well, there's an issue with this narrative. Uh, we need to kind of do everything we can to sort of work so against you're, it. You're being, are you being diplomatic here? I mean, look, <laughs> one of the issues we're looking at are voter suppression, sure, race. Sure. There's a deep contest taking place in the United States, and you've got a president who's seeking to bring everybody together, but you've also got an opposition which is very dangerously seeking to polarize. Yeah, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, you said that you have a president who's seeking to bring the country together. I certainly believe that, but there are a number of people who don't believe that. Right. And I think that's a, a, an issue that we need to confront, and that's something that we're thinking about all the time at IPS, is how do we uh, ensure that the messages that we have uh, kind of go beyond the choir. Um, so that is right. an incredibly important part of what we do and what we think about on a consistent basis here, and try to account for the different perspectives that people have. Uh, certainly voter suppression is a major issue. Um, I speak with a number of people every day who are quite upset with the current administration because there's a sense that 
the current administration is in office because of the mobilization of black and brown people across this country, people who sit in line for hours and hours on end, who uh, put up with all kinds of nonsense as they were in those lines and still kind of uh, stayed in those lines, voted and ensured that we'd have a democratic president in office today. Um, uh, Biden started with a kind of big social program uh, that he sort of advocated for that was meant to benefit a number of people in this country. Uh, that, as we all know, hasn't worked out quite the way he hoped, and I'm happy that he's still kind of pursuing that agenda. And then he pivoted decisively to voting rights, and there were some people, many activists, who saw that as a kind of cynical move because they wondered why that wasn't the first thing that he, right. you know, he sort of focused on. Where, what is the opposition that you feel you're up against? That's a really important question, and it's one I think about constantly. Because I think a lot of people think about the opposition in terms of political party, like we're, we're fighting against the Republicans, we're going against conservatives. I'm not quite sure that's the right frame, and perhaps I'm speaking somewhat out of school when I put it that way. Again, I, I think I'm partly inspired by my background. I grew up with uh, conservatives. I grew up in Utah. Everybody I knew was a Republican. Right. Uh, and the same applies as well in, in, in Texas. And many of my friends are Trump supporters. Um, so whenever I go home to see my parents, I'm inevitably having a conversation or a drink with somebody I went to high school with who has very different political views than I do. Um, and I, I think that part of the issue is that a number of people in those parts of the country feel they, you know, and other people have said this, they feel as if you have a bunch of elites who don't really care about right. where they're coming from. And But I think the more... A pernicious belief, if you will, that they have um, is that they feel as if they're not a part of the American future. So they'll, you know, kind of say to me, "Hey, you know, you're you're a black man. This entire sort of new structure is being created to ensure that people like you are successful. What about me and my family? Right? I didn't do anything. I wasn't um, even if my sort of great 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 grandfather." Uh, benefited from slavery and the kind of structures that were in place to benefit white people. I am not in that position now. Um, and you have a party that isn't speaking to my concerns and needs. Trump is in a very visceral way. What is your response to that, Tope? And my response would be that we need to kind of, maybe this, I, as a storyteller, I do think a great deal about narratives. And I think that's something that we need to pay a lot of attention to you on the left. Do you think those that your high school friends that now voted for Trump, that you have a drink with, yeah. do you think they're racist? That's a critical question. I don't think they think, and let me answer this as carefully as I can, <laughs> in case one of my dear friends is watching. I don't think they're racist in the sense that they, you know, will, you know, if they see me, they'll call me the N-word or something like that. So there's not a kind of explicit racism. Um, do they believe in a kind of system that has not, uh, that has benefited them at the expense of lots of other people? Yes, they do. Is that system racist? I believe it is. Um, so I think there are systemic issues here that we need to confront in a very real way. Um, and, so, and I think a lot of them congratulate themselves because they, they'll say, well, I voted for black people before. I voted for Barack Obama. I've, I've, you know, um, I work with a black person. <laughs> I've invited black people over to my home. <laughs> hey, Tope, we're having a drink right now, and you're black, and I love you, and you love me, right? So I think there is a kind of... A, a lot of people have in, in their minds a difference between personal interaction right. and the kind of systemic issues that bedevil this country. But there's some truth to the fact that the system is not serving them. Yeah, absolutely. Not to the fact that it's yeah. suddenly serving people like you. Exactly. I mean, uh, yeah. And, and but I think this is very interesting to me because the, the, um, you, you know, a huge act of persuasion historically is needed. Yes. Given the scale of support for Trumpism yep. that you've described. Yep. And so how can that persuade? That's a cultural, not just a political issue. A thousand percent. It's cultural. And yeah. how do you go about doing that? Uh, if I had the exact answer to that, <laughs> I'm not sure we'd be having. But this, this is the main question to me. Right. You know, one of the major things that has happened in this country over the past few months is this kind of, there's all this screaming about critical race theory. Critical race theory is a proxy for a set of ideas. I think if you cornered somebody on the street who says, oh, I hate critical race theory, and asked them what it actually is, they'd have no idea. Yeah. But it points in the direction of a lot of things they're upset about, right? Um, this idea that, again, black and brown people are getting all these advantages at the expense of, of, of all of us. Um, that everyone's too woke, that we don't have a sense of humor anymore. 
So I think it means different things to different people. And the thing that none I none of these are true. None of this well, is true. Right? I, but it doesn't it doesn't matter anymore. But it isn't true. You're right. right. But it doesn't matter because um, there are people on the right who weaponize this kind of formally somewhat arcane sort of le legal theory yeah. and have made it something else. And so I think we can be upset about it and say it isn't true, but uh, it is inspiring action, yeah. right? And the, and the point it inspires action, the truthfulness of it ceases to be important. Understood. So the question for us is how do we respond to that? I think um, that we, one thing that the left, I think, it, I think we make a mistake because we have a number of facts on our side. We say, oh, look at these facts about climate change. Look at these facts about inequality. Look at these facts about how uh, militarized our budget is. This is an atrocity. We need to do something about it. Um, and I think the right is on the back foot if we're talking about facts and figures. And they've, they've come up with another way of ensuring that they continue to have support. And they say, well, let's lean into cultural issues in a way that uh, others don't. And, and that's one reason why they're incredibly successful. I think that we need to kind of play on that ground as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have a really powerful argument if we mix the facts that we have our, at our disposal with a really strong narrative about a future of America that includes everyone. That is, needs to be something that we do. Um, and, I, and I think that's part of what we're trying to begin to do at IPS as well, to right. kind of begin to craft a narrative of the future that includes folks see, from all walks of life. Do you see that in a way as trying to generate a new politics? It's a question yeah. that I've asked some of the Congress people, that they're, they're for a democratic capitalism. That is one pathway to a future to, to uh, create what Martin Luther King Jr. called the beloved community, which is a community in which everyone has what they need and there's kind of a mutual yeah. connections of the love. love. that does justice. Precisely, that's exactly it. Um, the question is how do we get to that place? Um, and we get to that place by informing people that all of us are important, that um, if you have a sense that certain people are getting something at your expense, that that's not the case, that what's actually happening is that we're trying to account for um, sort of systemic racism and the way that certain people have been held back for generations in this country. And it becomes hard to make that argument <laughs> in a capsule form that doesn't, uh, that sort of lets people know that they're still part of this big story, they're still part of this grand experiment that's been going on for over two centuries. And, and to go beyond the borders of right. this country, that you know the global south is a part of this as well. That, I think, is our major challenge. How do we craft a vision and a narrative that um, sort of encompasses all of this? And I think we're, we're kind of engaged in that work, and that's something that's core to the kind of thinking we do here at IPS all the time. What is the role of corporate power, hmm. in, which is also thinks globally and yep. is shaping events yep. globally, yep. Uh, and which you can now see, especially the defense industry, is in a way rubbing its hands over the disastrous Precisely. invasion of the Ukraine. How do you feel that uh, uh, um, the relationship of the democratic movement you're, you're seeking yeah. um, will relate to that kind of power? I think it goes back to what I said before. There, uh, to, you know, I think in terms of story, so I hope you'll indulge me if I just tell a little bit That's story, story. <laughs> right now. My dad, in certain ways, he invoked what in some quarters might be called conservative values when he was raising me. Um, and that included the idea that you, um, you know, that you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? right? You know, this idea that if you just work incredibly hard, even if everything in the world is arrayed against you, that there's a pathway forward. That there are parts of that narrative that are incredibly compelling for immigrants and for people who have been in this country for a long time. One of the reasons why Trump was so successful, again, leaning away from the kind of analysis of data and everything else is because of he, he was a walking narrative, right, of success that a lot of people um, identified. Co identified with and connected to. Um, I know a lot of people on the left are allergic to that or just kind of dismiss it out of hand. But I think that there are a number of people who are kind of waiting for an invocation of faith as we talk about some of the grand challenges we face. I mean, if there's one thing that religion and faith do really well, it's the grand story about human history, about who we are, where we've come from, and where we will go. I think that needs to be something that we think about more deeply as well.